So it'll make it to us uh, nice and safely. Um, speaking of uh, making it to us, Pastor Greg's going to be making it to us. So everyone, please welcome Pastor Greg. Um, we are in chapter six of Daniel. We've been in a series uh, for Daniel, and and uh, nobody ever asks me what my favorite series is. Uh, but if somebody did, I would thank Daniel. I've really enjoyed studying, preparing, and listening to the, uh, ideas about Daniel. I've learned a lot, and um, I think it really applies to the age that we live in right now. A lot of the same issues that Daniel confronted are a great lesson for us of how to live in our crazy age, and just a, a fantastic example uh, for us. Daniel, at this point, when we first Talk, sorry, talking about Daniel. Daniel was a young man, maybe 14, 15 years old. Now he's perhaps 85. He's, he's lived a long time, gone through a lot of different things. And um, I, I was noticing this week, because I was thinking about Daniel being around in his mid-80s, that in America, we have a lot of very active people in their 80s and even in their 90s. I saw a YouTube video of Frankie Valli, um, yes, he is still alive. He is 94 and still doing concerts. I thought, wow, that's, that's like kind of crazy. And, um, and then I, you know, I, I read something around there about Robert Murdoch and Rupert Murdoch, and he's 93. And, um, and of course, our current president is up there. And, and then we have, you know, potential running guys, and they're way up there. And, you know, our own senator, Nancy Pelosi, um, I think she's clocking in at like 128 years by now. <laughs> and it's, it's something else. Mick Jagger, I mean, we got to give it to Mick Jagger. He's still up there doing concerts, and, and he's in his 80s, I believe. <laughs> and uh, telling us that he was not going to do this when he was an old man at 40. And uh, there he goes. Uh, it's just very common these days. Now, I'll hear somebody say, you know, are you thinking about retirement or when are you going to retire? I don't think a retirement is an American concept. <laughs> I, I just don't see it as something that we do here. I, I see people going, people starting new things. And it just really, it, it's an exciting age, time for us to be in where life doesn't seem to slow down much um, uh, in any way. And it might be our society, you know, the lack of family sticking together and how we care for each other. It might be some of that. I don't know. But uh, I think Daniel would love living in our age right now. <laughs> I don't think you'd see a whole lot of difference as far as politics, but I think he would say, wow, this, I, I've got a lot of people keeping up with me, <laughs> and I've got some people to catch up on um, with that. So I think that's pretty cool. I, I want, do want to say, we're, today we're going to talk about probably the most famous story about Daniel, that's Daniel in the lion's den, probably the most well-known, if there is a well-known story uh, in the Bible, it might be Daniel and the lion's den. And a lot of times our assumption is that it's a lesson about how if you live right with God, the lions won't eat you. And that's, that's, a, that's a good lesson, but it's not the lesson that the Bible teaches um, the idea is not that if you live right with God and you are innocent and everything you do is close to God, that you're going to get out of this life without being eaten by lions. You don't. We all get attacked by lions, and someday the last lion will get us, and wherever that is, but that is not the hope or the lesson of the story of Daniel in the lion's den. It's about the lion den, lion's den itself or even the real lion's den. Um, as, it, as it is. Um, Daniel, all the way through, as we've read through these chapters, the horrible things that happened in his life were a result of government. And it was a very dark, very oppressive, very cruel government. There were high points, low points. Daniel was a government official, a very high administrator. Um, there in the Babylonian government, one of the great empires of the century, millenniums. And he suffered as a result of the decisions of government. Um, some of you have suffered as a result of the decisions of governments. 
Uh, we have uh, people come from all over the world, maybe who suffer as a result of the decisions of governments here, but uh, it's very common for all of us to know examples and have examples where governments, uh, people in authority over us, have made people suffer um, for horrible reasons. And so this is something Daniel certainly understood and he went through. Um, there are dark times that come in governments um, all over the world. I don't think anybody is safe from that. It can, it, we do know that when governments change, they change fast. And the lesson we can learn from Daniel is what doesn't change is God. And that God does take care of us and we are to walk and stay close to God regardless of what happens in and around us. Um, I, I did come across a story, a, a humorous story, about three guys. One was a surgeon, one was an engineer, and one was a politician. And they were arguing about who had the most important job. And so they decided to talk about, well, who had the first job? Well, it's the oldest profession among us. And, and so the surgeon, he said, you know, it's very simple. Obviously, surgery was the very first profession in the world because God, he had to carve out of Adam's rib a wife for him, for Eve. And so obviously, it's surgery. Okay, I get that, you know, it makes sense. Everybody looked at that. But then the engineer said, yeah, but before God ever created man, there was chaos and then God created this world and brought order to it and made beauty and made things work and made sense of it. So obviously, the earliest profession is an engineer, an engineer. And the last guy, the politician, just kind of looked at him and laughed, asked him, where do you guys think the chaos came from? So... I have to let a little time go by <laughs> as it makes its way through, <laughs> but it's fun. Um, so where we're going to pick up here in chapter 6 is Daniel, again, is being elevated by the new king that we talked about last week, Darius, and, and everything's going super great, and Darius wants him to be over 120 other governors that are in the empire. And he wanted him, the Bible's very clear, because of David, because of uh, Daniel's excellent workmanship, were administrative abilities. And so he just, uh, just surpassed everybody else in, in his, his work. And so the king put him in charge. And of course, when the king puts one person in charge of the 120, there's 119 that disagree with that decision. And so their thing is, well, how do we get Daniel out of here? And so one of us can move up. And so that's what they began to work on. How can we do this? They could not find a flaw to exploit in Daniel. So they found a way to manipulate a thing where he could get into trouble. The only thing Daniel was consistent at uh, that they could point to was that he would pray to God three times a day. And we see this all the way through Daniel. We see that when he was uh, a young man and the king was trying to get him to eat different foods, Daniel refused in prayer. He discovered, no, I'm not going to do this. All the way through every story is in prayer, in prayer, in prayer, in prayer, in prayer. And so Daniel gets to this place and they see, well, he does pray to his God three times a day. And they connived among themselves and came up with this brilliant idea that they're going to go to the king. And they told the king, King, you are just so awesome. You're so wonderful. You provide everything. And these people are so ungrateful to you for providing everything. So what we think we should do is we should pass a law that everybody has to only pray to you and only thank you for 30 days. And uh, we need to really make this hard. And so we need to you know, put a punishment to it if they don't. And the king thought about it. He says, you know, I, I do do a lot. And everybody should be more grateful for me. And I don't feel that I am appreciated very much. So, yeah, I, I think this. What kind of a punishment do you guys think we should do for somebody who doesn't, uh, isn't appreciative of what I provide for them? And they said, well, obviously, king, they, they should be thrown to the lion's den. And the king said, oh, yeah, I like that idea. That sounds really good. I was, okay, let's make that a law. Okay, anybody who doesn't thank me or worship me for the next 30 days uh, is thrown into the lion's den. That will get rid of a lot of riffraff. And so he signs the decree, um, all the governors get all excited, and they all, and the Bible says this, they all go in a group <laughs> straight to Daniel's house. 
and they found him guilty, praying in the middle of the day to his own God, to God. And so they get all excited, and then they all run back to the king and said, oh, king, we found somebody who isn't praying or isn't thankful for you. And the king said, well, who would that be? Well, that would be Daniel. Well, the king was not very happy with that. He was distraught. He was angry. He realized he'd been caught in a scheme. Um, He felt betrayed by his own governors, which he had been. And he, the Bible says that the king did everything he could to reverse that rule, but he wasn't able to reverse it by the laws that they had at that time for that king. And so with, with great distress, he, um, he ordered Daniel to be thrown into the lion's den. And that's where I'll pick up, and I'll just read this straight through for you, um, if I can find it. I know I have it here somewhere. I guess I don't. <laughs> now I got it here. Let's see here. Boy, Isaiah's long, isn't it? Boy, Jeremiah. When did they add those extra chapters in Jeremiah? Jeez. (laughs) Ezekiel. Wow. They have a lot of pages in Ezekiel. (laughs) Okay, here I am. (laughs) All right, here we go. We'll pick up here at verse 16. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve, continually rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own singlet ring and with the rings of the nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up, and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, may the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty." The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when he was lifted out, when he was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him because he had trusted in his God. After this goes, the king is so impressed and so amazed by the result of Daniel being able to answer his call and that he survived this night in the lion's den. He threw all the governors in with their wives and their children. Um, Why their children? Uh, Probably because they were very loud around the palace. And he went on to write these wonderful things about God and really commanded his empire to honor God and from now on to worship and to serve God. And so we always see in Daniel, the stories of the kings that he is with, he has an amazing effect to bring the kings into adoration, under submission of God. And we've seen this all along. And I think there's a wonderful example of a man who lived his light, life in such a way that it brought light to the, and around the darkness to him. And what an effect he had that people would see that and that they would understand that there's something different about Daniel. And I think God calls us to that same same level of of impact on those around us, that we live our lives so differently that people would see that. There's three lessons that I want to share out of this. I got a little bit more than three lessons, but but certainly we'll start with the three first. And, And the first one is very simply this. Don't confuse the real lion's den. The real real lion's den is not the spot where all the lions were to eat him up. The real lion's den was in Daniel's home, where Daniel consistently spent time praying to God three times a day. That is the place where all the decisions were made. The lion's den, the actual lion's den, is just a result of what happened in the lion's den where Daniel was challenged, where he was uh, put on notice, where he was confronted with the evil around him and made to decide how he himself was going to live and confront and live in that society. That's the real lion's den, and each of us live in a real lion's den. 
the, the conditions or the circumstances or the consequences that we go to and people say, oh, you know, now I'm being mistreated. No, no, that's not the big issue. The big issue is when you were alone with God, what did you say to God? How did God lead you? What were the decisions that you made in that place? And so we need to remember, I am constantly in the lion's den. I am constantly listening to God and listening to how he wants me to live and how he wants me to move forward. What is it that God is calling me to? The second thing I want to bring up in this is that a lot, okay, maybe all of us, we have regrets over what we would call our lack of discipline to pray. We get busy. um, We get distracted. It's hard to pray. I have all kinds of things that we throw out. It's not an issue of discipline. We always like to think it's discipline, and it's a weakness. But I would, I would suggest that there's a more cynical reason that we don't pray. And we might not like this reason, but it is a reason. And I think we need to own it and just say it is what it is and say, okay, it, that really is the issue. That is the issue. And what I would say is the real issue that a lot of us don't pray, uh, we regret how little we pray, is this our pride. I think so often we move through life with this mindset of, I can do this. I can accomplish this. I just have to take care of this. I just have to make this phone call. I just have to send this text. I just have to send this email. I just have to have this conversation, or I I just have to move some stuff from here over to there. And what is that? I can do everything. I can take care of it. I don't care how much discipline you have. There's no room for God. There's no place for God. And so in our lives, we get so used and so comfortable with saying, I can do this, I can take care of this, that of course you're not going to pray. Why would you? You've taken care of everything. And all along, what we know the truth is, is that we haven't taken care of anything. What we have done is we've just made the situation worse by excluding God's involvement. Now, I go through my life, and I'll tell you very quickly, I go down a big, long list of everything I got to get done. And I might even have a a, a false sense of accomplishment to everything I do. And I'll feel good about that. But when I do come, usually into this space right here, this sanctuary, and it's, it's not the space, it's just me being somewhere. When I come in here and I pray, and sometimes I don't even know what I'm going to begin praying for, it's crazy how all of a sudden new insights come to my mind and new people start appearing in my head, and new ideas come in, and direction, and light, 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 light. And all of a sudden, everything I had planned to do becomes so unimportant. It becomes so irrelevant, and I get really excited, and I pull out my little memo thing on my phone, and I just start writing. I start writing what God's given me. And I tell you, that comes when you give time, when you give God time to speak to you when you give time, God time to speak to you. And I want to challenge all of us. Do we give God time to speak to us? God knows how to live life. He knows who you are. He knows your whole, you know, your whole wiring. He knows what you're like. He knows how to best help you. He knows what your desires are. He knows how to help you be most fulfilled. But it's hard to tell somebody who's not listening which way to go. You've got to ask God. So I'd encourage all of us to, to try to up that somehow and re- realize that it's an issue of pride that I don't listen or I don't pray enough to God. What i got to do is i got to come back in and just own it, that I'm not going anywhere. I'm not taking this life anywhere. Uh, I, I don't have a control like I would like to think I do. What I need is God. What I need is a word from the Lord to help me get forward to move through in this. And the third thing, the lesson I want to share from this passage is very simply this. Lots of times we are impressed by somebody, it's specifically the story of Daniel, where he goes into that lion's den and he faces it, and we don't get any words of protest, and we don't get any crying or anything like that. What we get is Daniel went there, and so our, our impression is God, that Daniel is so brave. And yes, he's incredibly brave. It's a lot of courage to do that, but that courage was not summoned in that moment. That courage was summoned all through his life. And that he, little by little, in the very smallest ways, always was up in his level of courage. He was always challenging his level of bravery in the situations that he was facing. And I think for all of us, we constantly bombarded with things that 
takes a lot of courage on our part to stand up to say the right thing or to keep our mouth shut at the right moment. It takes courage to do all of those things. It takes humility to do all those things. And as we do that, I think God really, really anoints us in that work. And there's an accumulative, there's a pattern to our lives that enable us at those moments where everybody's looking to prove ourselves brave, to prove ourselves courageous. But it does not come because everybody's looking at us. It comes in those everyday moments that we live all the way through. As Christians today, we are very much subject to ridicule because we look so strange in the world. I love what Jesus says there in John chapter 5, 18 and 19. Um, the, the world hates you and it's because uh, you don't belong to the world. And if you did belong to the world, they would love you as their own. <laughs> but as it is, the world hates you, but I have chosen you out of the world. I, that's why the world hates you. That's what Jesus is telling his own disciples. So you can be sure that any time we begin to center our lives on Jesus, and however that might look throughout the world, people are going to have a problem with you. I get it. I know, I get why Christians are strange in the eyes of the world. Because our quote-unquote religion, if you will, doesn't make sense to anybody who's not a Christian. What's religion? Religion is what you do to earn God's reward, God's blessing, because you're such a good person. But you say that to a Christian, a Christian goes, no, no, that's not really it. <laughs> well, don't you have to be good? Well, that is a result of having a relationship with Jesus, but that is not what we're trying to be. <laughs> we're trying to be right in our relationship with God. And they go, what are you talking about? Just get straight to what you have to do so you can get the reward. That's all you guys are doing. No, 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 that's, that's not really what we're doing at all. <laughs> that, that's not who we are. And this, and this, uh, this thing that Christians have, that we are tuned in and tied with with the Holy Spirit who speaks to us on a regular basis. That's something that the world really doesn't understand either. It's basically other religions are, hey, okay, you've got everything you need right here. Now it's just different degrees of realizing what's already here. But it's like if you go to a foreign country. So when I was born, right, my parents took me to a foreign country. And I spent my first 16 years of life there. And what happened? I was deeply influenced by that culture and that country and their politics and their, their ways and their music and their food, ways that still have a lasting effect on me here. And so here I am growing up in this culture, in this place, and I don't fit in. I don't fill the holes. It's, it, it's, an all, it's got a lot of square pegs and round holes. And a lot of times, that's how we are in this world. We don't belong to this world. We're not a product of this world. We're not trying to please this world. There's a lot of square pegs and round holes in life of Christian where you just don't fit in. Why? Because we are listening outside of our own culture. We are taking our direction from someone, uh, an existence of God's ex kingdom that is not a part of this kingdom. Our interest is not only what happens here. Our interest is always what is God doing? What is God bringing? And so our mindset is not um, what do you want me to do? The mindset is always, what is God telling me to do? The mindset is not, do you think this is right? Do you think this is wrong? No, the mindset is, God, you tell me, is this right? Is this what it means to follow in your footsteps? And that's how we as Christians are to be, are constantly reminded and constantly guided by that foreign influence into our lives, that, that a part that doesn't belong to this world or this culture, that we would find our comfort and our, our, our well-being and our peace of mind in who God is and what God says and how God leads us. That's where we are as Christians. And, and as I look at that, and as I, I think about that, it causes me to think about what is core in our lives, in our relationship with God. What, what is it that really matters to us as Christians? Unlike the world, it's some very strange things. It's not accomplishing this, not accumulating that. It's not the prestige or anything along those lines. What is it? We are kind of a strange people. This is what is core to us, very, very, very core. God knows me. Okay, you say that to someone who isn't a Christian, who doesn't know the Lord. Okay, God knows you, really. You're that important that God would know you. 
No, <laughs> I am nowhere near that important, but my God is that great and that personal that he would take notice of me, that he knows my name, that he's written my name. Ah, it's just weird that God, that, that God loves me, that I love God. Really? <laughs> yeah, that, that's core. What about everything else? But all your rules? And all, no, no, that's, that's where it's at, that God knows me. And that God has prepared a house for me in heaven, an eternity with him in all of eternity in heaven. That's what God has prepared for me. And so what happens in this world just pales terribly in comparison to what we as Christians are looking forward to that's coming down the road. Maybe it'll be within our lifetime. We don't know. We believe that Christ will return. If Christ delays in his return, then we will go through death, and then we will see what God has for us. Regardless, what we are living for is not the things of this world. And so the things that come, the things that go, yeah, of course they're important, but they don't have that level of importance like we have in eternity, because our eternity is secure in Jesus. And so we, we go through this life with this, these core beliefs, these core attitudes that really change everything about us, as did Daniel, in the same, same way as did Daniel. You and I, we live, and you much more than me, we live in a very secular, post-Christian society where our values aren't even accepted as traditional Christian values. Those are the hateful things now. Those are the things that are terrible but we hold by those because they belong to God. So as Daniel lived in a very secular, very opposed to God society, so do we. Daniel did it incredibly successfully. He was a great help to all those around him. He made the place a better place by exponentially. In the same way, that's our charge. We're not called to shy away from the world, to run away from the world, to you know, you know, think that the world's filled with Draculas. No, we live here, we make the world a better place. It's not our home, but we are here to serve. We're here to make the place better. We can live here, we can live here very successfully. Christians can be in every aspect of society. And with wherever we are, may we be making it a better place. May we be the ones that are proved to be the honest ones, the hardworking ones, the high ethic ones, the high moral ones. But that's, Daniel shows us that that's it. And, and as Christians, we don't know where God's going to lead us, what doors God's going to open. We're always looking, okay, where's God taking me next? Sometimes God takes us into a lion's den. And we're like, uh-oh, what's up with this? But that's not the moment where we say no. What we say is, God's taken me into a lion's den. Let's see what happens now. Let's see what's going to change. All I know is that God is leading me here. The promise is he is with me. I have that assurance through his spirit. And we're going to see what this looks like together. It's not that you're never going to get scratches or you're never going to get a, a lion bite or something like that. No, all those things happen to everybody. But the difference for us is God is leading us through this. Let's see where God is taking us. Let's see where God... And, and certainly, may I not oppose it in fear that God is not able to fulfill his purpose for me. Let me accept what it is that God is bringing me so that God is free to fulfill his purpose that he has for my life. May I not sabotage God's plans. May I not be a hindrance to what God wants to do, regardless if I judge it to be good or bad or however it is. Let God's, let God's purpose live in me. May I live for God's glory, meaning may I show God's importance and God's place in all of the world, certainly in the spot that I occupy in it, in the place that I take. Um, there's a lady that I think so highly of. She's passed away recently. Her name was Elizabeth Elliot. She became very famous in the late 50s, early 60s, because her husband was a, um, wanted to be a missionary to the Agaruna Indians in the middle of the Amazon. And so him and a couple of buddies of his, they said, we're going to be missionaries to these headhunters. And um, so they got, in a, they got a plane, and they went in. They tried to make contact. They're in the jungles of Peru. And uh, they did make contact with them. And then the Indians turned against them and killed all of them. And uh, Elizabeth Elliot was at the home base, and so she did not get killed. But what do you think she did? She went right back into those Indians, <laughs> and she continued to minister to them. And over a very short period of time, they couldn't believe the sacrifice that these guys gave. They weren't there to change anything. They were there to tell them about Jesus. And wow, what a change it was in that tribe. And the, the, the morals of that tribe, and how they treated each other, and the lack of peace that they had with the other tribes, it absolutely changed that. And that, you still see that today. 
And Elizabeth Elliot went on to uh, have a great impact. But she tells a story about her childhood. She grew up very, very poor, but she was like one of 12 children. And she was on the younger side when her dad died very quickly, unexpectedly, leaving the mother a widow of 12 kids. And this is in days when we didn't have all the social services that we have today. And the mother was so afraid of what happened, the loss of her husband, that she became paralyzed with fear. Um, Not paralyzed physically, but she could not speak. And she just went silent. And she just laid in bed for a period of time. And the kids just grew more and more nervous. Oh no, (laughs) now what? Now what do we do? And what Elizabeth Elliot explains is that she woke up one morning and she heard her mother sweeping the house with a broom. And what she heard was, trust and live, trust and live, trust and live. Every time the broom went back and forth, the mother was singing to herself, trust and live, trust and live. It's all going to be well. Trust and live, trust and live. God takes care of us. Trust and live, trust and live. That's what we're going to do. We're going to trust and live. God's always taking care of us. He's going to keep taking care of us. Just trust and live, trust and live. And that mother sang herself back to health by realizing that life does go on, that it's never easy, but you have God to help you. God is with you. And she said everything in their family changed from that moment on. And they all began to recognize the importance of trusting and just living. Live your life. Life is hard, but live it trusting God. And I see that. I think Daniel would love that story. I think Daniel would say, yeah, that's exactly it. Do what you can do. You can't control everything. You don't have the solutions to everything, but God does. And as long as you trust and live, you're going to walk closer to him. The closer you walk to him, the better things are going to start to get. And, and I think there's a beauty to that. I like how this passage ends. I like how this passage of this chapter ends. Um, I shouldn't have closed my Bible. Jeremiah, Ezekiel, oh, there it is. <laughs> um, the last verse, verse 28, look at what it says. So Daniel prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus the Persian. So that's, that's kind of the idea of um, what the kings that Daniel went through. He prospered during the reign of Darius and the reign of Cyrus. Now, the reason it's fascinating that it ends with the reign of Cyrus is that remember how Daniel was taken captive by Nebuchadnezzar and exiled all the way to Babylon and lived there as a slave, and he achieved these great achievements in, uh, in administration in the kingdom. And then he just watched king after king after king come. We've gone over those. And here we are with Darius. Cyrus, Cyrus is the king that God used to send all the Jews back to Jerusalem. So Daniel, in his lifetime, saw the whole thing come back around. And so all the fears that he had, all the desperation he might have experienced, God gave him the length of years to see how, yep, I'm taking care of all of this. I'm going to take care of this. You're going to go back to Jerusalem. You're going your way back. I've watched over you. I think in our own lives, we can get pretty desperate just living and trusting, living and trusting. Is anything happening? Is anything going anywhere? Yes, it is. God is at work in your life in ways that we cannot see, in ways that we cannot perceive, but God is at work, and he is bringing all of us back home. God is bringing all of us back home, and that's a great reason for us to have hope and for us to rejoice, to remember we're in a, we're in a den. <laughs> fight the battles we got to fight. Be courageous, be ready, be open, be humble, be dependent on God, and God is taking care of everything else, and God will bring you to a better day. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity we've had to 